Heavenly Father, thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for bringing us here safely this morning. Thank you for watching over us as we slept last night, Heavenly Father. For we did not know where we were, but you brought us back. Thank you for your grace and your mercy you have upon our life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being such a loving and forgiving God. Thank you, Father, for all the days of our life. Heavenly Father, we know without you, we would not be able to make it. But you always dealt with us, Heavenly Father. You always curled us through all our trials and tribulations, Heavenly Father. But we know without you, we are not there. We worship you, Heavenly Father. We praise your holy name. There is none like you, Heavenly Father. We adore you. We thank you, Father. We will continue to praise your holy name, Heavenly Father. We will continue to do your work. Heavenly Father, for we know there's many trials out there, but Heavenly Father, we know with, with your guidance that you have curled us through it, Heavenly Father. We'll continue to try to win as many souls as we possibly can, Heavenly Father, to bring as many people into this church as possible, Heavenly Father. For Heavenly Father, we know it is, it is hard work, Heavenly Father, but we know that you will give us the strength and the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to do all these things, Heavenly Father. For it is you, Heavenly Father, to give us the strength to do everything that we need to do, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for our children, Heavenly Father. We thank you and bless you for watching over them each and every day, Heavenly Father. We ask that you continue to watch over them, guide them, and lead up them in the righteous way, Heavenly Father. For they need you, Heavenly Father. They need you in our life, Heavenly Father. Continue to touch them, Heavenly Father. Continue to guide them in the righteous way, Heavenly Father, so they won't follow the wrong people, Heavenly Father. And there's so many wrong people out here that they can follow, Heavenly Father. I ask you, to, Heavenly Father, to continue to guide them, Heavenly Father. Take control of their mind. Lead them in that righteous way, Heavenly Father, where they'll worship and look up to you, Heavenly Father, instead of idols, Heavenly Father. Bless them, Heavenly Father. Guide them. Teach them, Heavenly Father, for they need you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to watch over and uplift this church. Continue to bring new members to this church, Heavenly Father. Up the, uplift our spirit, Heavenly Father. Uplift the, 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 um, our finances in all areas, Heavenly Father. In all areas of our life, Heavenly Father. Uplift us, Heavenly Father. Uplift us, Heavenly Father. Continue to watch over us, Heavenly Father. Continue to guide us, Heavenly Father. For you are worthy to be praised, Heavenly Father. There is none like you, Heavenly Father. We will continue to adore you, Heavenly Father. We will continue to do your work, Heavenly Father. We will preach to anyone willing to listen, Heavenly Father. We will go. We will use our Facebook, Heavenly Father. We will use any, any means necessary, Heavenly Father, to get your message through, Heavenly Father. For we are, we, are, we are your workers, Heavenly Father. We will continue to do your work, Heavenly Father. We are proud to do your work, Heavenly Father, for you have done so much for us, Heavenly Father. You, you don't ask anything of us, Heavenly Father, but you did so much for us, so we are willing to do everything we can for you, Heavenly Father, because it's you, Heavenly Father, who wake us up in the morning. It is you, Heavenly Father, you have our day already planned out for us before we even wake up. When we sleep and don't know what's going on, Heavenly Father, you already know our plans for the day. So we thank you, Heavenly Father. We praise your holy name. There is none like you. You are worthy, Heavenly Father. You are so worthy. We thank you, Father. We will continue to praise you, Heavenly Father. We will continue to worship you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the service that we are about to hear today. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you touch whoever is coming up here to give your message, Heavenly Father, that we will take this message home with us, Heavenly Father, and we will live by it, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank that everyone who's coming here this morning arrive here safely, Heavenly Father. Guide them, Heavenly Father. Lead them in the righteous way, Heavenly Father, for they need you and we need you each and every day. There is none like you, Heavenly Father. There is none like you. We will continue to praise you, Heavenly Father. You are worthy, Heavenly Father. You are worthy to be praised. We thank you, Father. We could never thank you enough for all you have done for us, Heavenly Father, but we will continue to praise you. We will continue to uplift you. We will continue to strive for excellence in your name, Father, for you are worthy 
Father, and we are, thank you. We praise you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. the Lord. I need you. You need me. We all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We all a part of God's body. It is His will that ever need is being supplied you are so important to me i need you to survive look to your neighbor and sing the song i need you you need me we all are part of god's body stand with me agree with me we all are part of god's body it is his will not every need is being supplied you are so important to me i need you to survive to so appreciate god for the next person standing for the person standing next to you thank him for for everyone for the life of your brethren for seeing the next person you saw them last week and you seen them again this week god is good I appreciate god for their lives What a marvelous God, what a marvelous, he has the marvelous things for us. What a marvelous God, what a marvelous, he used to do marvelous things for me all. What a marvelous God, what a marvelous. He has the marvelous things for us all. What a marvelous God. What a marvelous. He will do it again and again. The things that are impossible. The things that money cannot buy. They are the things that God is doing for us. Our biggie, biggie things. I wonder, wonder things. He will do it again and again. Hallelujah. What a marvelous God. What a marvelous. He used to do marvelous things for us. What a marvelous God. What a marvelous. He will do it again and again. God will put a word in your heart to, today. Uh, if you did not come here with an expectation, create an expectation. It is not too late to have an expectation now. What are your expectations for today? Do you just come just like a normal service? I have an expectation. And whatever expectation you have, go with meet them in Jesus' name. Let's open our hymn, GHS 177.
search me o god search me o god ghs 177 GHS 
Praise the Lord. Let us remain standing. We shall listen to G.S. message as we shall stand of the Sacred Scripture today. It's a one of the powerful message we will I prefer listening to. I pray that everybody will be diligent in listening and then in putting things down. And God will help us as we are listening in Jesus' name. That we always have in coming to study your let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we always have in coming to study your word together. We also thank you because of maintaining our love for your word. We are praying, O oh Lord, that our coming here every Monday like this will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Reveal your truth and reveal yourself to us tonight as we study your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that the riches of your word will be in our experiences as we touch our lives with your word. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are still continuing with our study of the Epistle General of James. We're now in chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 5 and 6 today. Please open your Bible as we read together the two verses that we're going to look at today. James chapter 4 from verse 5. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Those are the two verses we're looking at today. Verse 6 is very simple and very direct. Verse 5, many people, even some commentators, find verse 5 difficult to interpret. But the very central thought we have tonight is uh, the proud and the humble. And what is God's attitude to those two sets of people? Verse 6 tells us that God is a God of grace. But then he tells us that his grace is made available for those who are humble. On the other hand, we're told that God resists the proud. Therefore, it behooves us, befits us to understand what pride is and what humility is. Actually, pride is the attribute of the sinner. While humility, on the other hand, is a characteristic of the true believer. The believer, before he becomes a believer... He was humble enough to see himself as a sinner. He acknowledged his sin, his helplessness, as well as his inability to save himself. He continued in that humility and he confessed and he forsook his sins. He knew he couldn't save himself, so he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for us. And he knew that the sacrifice of Jesus is acceptable unto the Father. That is the thing that gave him salvation. And by the grace of God, as long as that grace remains in his life, he will remain humble. Why? Because he knew that everything he has, he owes everything to the Lord. The proud, on the other hand, whether a man or a woman, is blind. He cannot see, therefore he cannot admit that he is a sinner. He does not recognize his need of God or his need of the grace of God. Because he has not come to the realization, he will not ask. He will not come to the Lord in the right attitude. That makes him to remain in his sin. And because he remains in pride, the Lord resists him. And as we see that, it will be the prayer of our heart that we want to be humble so that the grace of God the goodness of God, and eventually the glory of God will become ours. There are three points we're going to look at as we study the passage of today. Number one, the reaction of God to the unfaithful. Number two, the rejection of the proud. Then number three, the reward 
of the humble. Let's come back to the passage. We're looking at James chapter 4, verse 5. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, the first difficulty theologians and commentators have concerning this verse is that it is not a direct quotation of the Old Testament, of any verse in the Old Testament. If you read from Genesis to Malachi, you will not find any verse that says, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Now, that's why the theologians have difficulty. What then does it mean when it says, Do you think that the scripture says in vain? When the scripture says, God, the one that lives in us, the spirit of God that dwells in us, lusteth to envy. It's actually summarizing many verses of the Old Testament. The word envy here in the original Greek is jealousy. And if you read that verse, in that way it actually means the spirit of God that dwells in us. He desires to make us understand that God is is a jealous God. But that is the totality of the testimony of the scriptures of the Old Testament, that God is jealous over his own. Now you will understand the kind of jealousy we are talking about if you connect verse 4 with verse 5. Already I explained to you last week that it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Actually, what James is saying is this. He's saying, before you came to know the Lord, as a sinner, you were totally in the world. You befriended the world. You loved the world. You gave your heart, your attention, your devotion to the world. But then God called you out of the world. And the relationship and fellowship and friendship between you and the world was broken. You became married unto God. And now as the bride of Christ, as the one that is totally in the love relationship with the Lord, as the husband is jealous over the wife, wanting to totally claim the love of that wife in the same way, God Almighty has put his spirit within us to remind us that he's jealously watching over us. As the husband demands the total love, of the wife, so God demands the total love and worship and devotion of the church and of the people of God. That's why it says, don't you understand then that the scripture is testifying in a uniform way that the spirit that dwells in us is jealous over our love, over our devotion, and over our worship. Let's see now the testimony of the Old Testament. We're looking at um, Osea, Osea chapter 2. We're looking at the picture of the married life of Osea. Using that, God wanted to use that as the illustration of the relationship between him and backsliding Israel, between him and the people that forsook the Lord and they gave their love to idols. Osea chapter 2, reading from verse 5. For their mother... As played the harlot, she that bear, she that conceived them, has done shamefully. For she, for she said, I will go after my lovers that gave, that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will edge up thy way with thorns. And make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then it was better with me than now. You will see here the married life of Osea being used as an illustration for the relationship between God and the children of Israel. 
He said the children of Israel, they departed from him. And they gave their love, they gave their devotion, they gave their worship to idols. And then they were now attributing the goodness and the blessings and the benefits they received in the kingdom. They were attributing it to the idols. That's what it said, that they attributed it to the lovers they were following after. Because God was jealous over the love of the children of Israel, he said, I know what I will do. I will hedge them around. I will make life inconvenient for them. I will take the things I have given them. Then they will realize, I will go back to my first husband. I will go back to God because it was better for me than at this time now while following all these evil things. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32, still reading about the experience of the children of Israel. As Moses was warning the children of Israel that a time will come when they will depart from the Lord. And then God will prove to them at that time that he was jealous over them. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou hast waxing fat, thou art grown sick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then they forsook, then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to the gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came up newly, whom your fathers feared not. You will see here the use of the word jealousy. Once again, please remember, this is the righteous jealousy that a man will have over the wife, that he wouldn't want the wife to go back to the old friend, old boyfriend, or any other man in the world. And God has a right. In fact, he has a righteous claim over us for himself. By creation as well as by redemption. We belong to him and we belong to him alone. Therefore, it is right, it is normal, it is proper for him to insist on his sole right to worship, to love, and to devotion. God will not accept any rival. He loves us with such a passion that he cannot bear any other love within our hearts. That's very similar to the love between the husband and the wife. In uh, other references of scripture, it's the same thing we see, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14 from verse 22. Here you will find that the same idea or the same truth is still being emphasized and re-emphasized. First Kings chapter 14 verse 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And then it says, there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. What the Old Testament emphasized, the New Testament also emphasized. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 20 to verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with the devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? That's still the same idea. That because of the love relationship between us, he wants our love and he wants the total love that we have. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 2. The bride of Christ must be fully devoted 
unto the Lord, unto Christ. Second Corinthians 11 verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. It's very clear then, you understand, what the Lord is telling us in uh, James chapter 4, verse 5, that the Lord demands our love. And any time you love self above God, you're provoking him to jealousy. Or you want to replace God with money. Or it is education, you're exalting above your worship. You're exalting above the love of God. Or it is an idol, a real idol, going to the village to worship idol, kneeling down before an idol again, when you have knelt before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Or it may be that you are making your marriage your God. You are making it an idol. Or you are turning your job into an idol, that the job will not allow you to read the Bible, to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord, and the job becomes number one in your life. Or it may be any other personal interest. If that happens in our lives, the Lord says, you are provoking him to jealousy. Let's come back to James chapter 4 now. We've looked at verse 5. We now want to look at verse 6. It says, but he giveth more grace. Here we will find out something is been talking about our being totally detached and separated from the world. That's in verse 4. And then in verse 5 it says he wants a total love, a total devotion, and a total worship. And if we do not give it to him, we provoke him to jealousy. But then it says if we will give him what he wants, he giveth more grace. Then it says wherefore, he says God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Point number two, the rejection of the proud. I want you to notice the tense that is used there. God resisted the proud. That means God is continually, all the time, always resisting the proud. What does that mean? He keeps the distance between him and the proud. He pushes the proud back. He says, no, you cannot come near me here. Because of the pride, pride separates us from God. Pride keeps us at a far distance from the Lord. Actually, this is a quotation coming from Proverbs. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, here we read, it says, Surely he scorneth the scorners, but giveth grace unto the lowly. You will know that, uh, you know, some words have been substituted in the New Testament. It's very simple at the end of the verse, but starting for the lowly. The New Testament uses the word the humble. But now it says the proud. It calls them the people that scorn, the scorners. And then it says God Almighty scorners the scorner. That is the people that are so proud and they scorn righteous secret things. The Lord will none of them, will have nothing of them because of their pride. Let's uh, go into the book of the Proverbs and see what is the attitude of the Lord. What's the reaction of the Lord to the people that are proud? In uh, Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and verse 17. These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven, an abomination unto him. Verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart, in verse 18, that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief. 19, a false witness that speaketh lies, and then it says, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. I read the whole thing for you to understand that somebody that has a proud look is in the company of the people that shed innocent blood. Maybe you say, praise the Lord, I'm saved, I'm born again, and there's something I will never do. I will not kill. I will not commit abortion. I will not shed innocent blood. But do you realize a proud look puts you in the same company, the same association with the people that are shedding innocent blood? In Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15, Verse 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border 
of the widow. Here it tells us there is judgment awaiting the people that are proud. By the way, when we talk of the proud, what does that mean? The proud person is the one who thinks of himself above all the other people around. He's the best, he's the greatest, he's the highest, he's the wisest. He doesn't know anybody that knows that has what he has. In a measure, he has contempt for all other people. He's right there up in the ivory tower and all the other people are down below in the valley. He thinks more of himself than really than he really is. Pride remains in the heart, therefore self sits on the throne. And when self is sitting on the throne, you shut the Savior out. It means such a fellow is uh, self-centered, it means he's haughty, and he's too proud to acknowledge a sin. Or if he has any fault or weakness, he's too proud to confess it even to the Lord, or to confess it before his own brethren. He will not confess his need of help, of grace, of salvation, and he cannot receive help from the Lord because his pride will not allow him to come and ask the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 16 verse 5, Proverbs 16 verse 5, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. You see what it says there? Everyone, whether a man or a woman, Everyone, whether a professing Christian or somebody that doesn't even come to church. But then it says, everyone that is proud in the heart. Sometimes we're able to manage ourselves, control ourselves, suppress that thing that it doesn't show in the open. And people do not see it. But God can see the heart and God knows that the pride is right there in the heart. But always remember, even though when the pride is in the heart and men or women may not see it, God resisted the proud. In verse 18, it says, pride goes before destruction. And an haughty spirit before a fall. As we look at the history of the people that are proud, uh, that the Bible gives us record of, you will see the fulfillment of this verse that we have read. Pride goeth before destruction. Think about Lucifer, the morning star that became Satan. It was pride that made him to be cast down away from the excellent glory that the Lord had given him. You think about Pharaoh. It was pride when he said, who is that God? I know not that God, and I'm not going to let the children of Israel go. Eventually, that pride brought him to destruction. Do you, you remember a man called Haman in uh, the book of Esther? Uh, Mordecai had offended him. He didn't bow down to him. Everybody bowed down to him. And pride was so much in the heart that he felt so offended. He said, I will not lay hand on that man alone. That will be below my dignity. I'm going to wipe off all the Jews. It was pride. Eventually, he himself was hanged on the gallows he had erected for Mordecai. And you think about Nebuchadnezzar? You think about Belshazzar, and you think about the New Testament people like Herod, you see it was pride that brought them down. And what was true then, it is still true today, pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. By the way, why are people proud? What are they proud of? Let's look at the Bible and see why people are proud. In Ezekiel chapter 28, chapter 28, in verse 17. Ezekiel 28, verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before the kings that they may behold thee. Number one thing is uh, the supposed duty, uh, beauty that some people think they have. And before, because they think they are beautiful, because of that, there's no humility. And they look at other people as if everybody else is ugly. I'm the only one that's handsome. I'm the only one that is beautiful. And because of that, pride fills their heart. Number two, uh, riches make some people to be proud. And there are riches that cannot go very far. Revelation chapter 3. 
in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. In the sight of God, these were miserable people. These were wretched people. They didn't have the salvation of the Lord. Spiritually, they were blind. Spiritually, they were poor. Spiritually, they were naked. But pride filled their hearts. And the pride appeared in their language. It appeared in their lifestyle. Just because of the riches they profess to have. Number three is because some people feel they are strong. They have strength, physical strength. They say, I'm never sick at all. I'm always going strong. And I can be anywhere and do anything. And therefore, because I'm stronger than the rest of the people, because of that, they are proud. And they will not give glory to God who has given them the strength. Psalm 73. Psalm 73, reading from verse 4. For there are no bands in their death. But their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. And violence covereth them as a garment. Other people are proud because of their position in life. Their position in the office. Or maybe unfortunately to their position in the church, in the religious circle. And they're always, uh, you know, telling other people, know where you are, know where I am. Know who I am and know who you are. Because of position, either secular or religious, they become proud. In Second Chronicles chapter 26, Second Chronicles chapter 26, open your Bible. This is Bible study. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16. But when he was strong, this was a king, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. And he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. He was a king, he wasn't a priest. And he didn't have the privilege, it wasn't his duty to offer sacrifice or to burn incense. But after all, I'm a king, I'm in authority, I can do anything, I can do everything. And when he was challenged, and as I am, the priest went in after him. And we see him, first call priest of the Lord, that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah, the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth. And had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. He will not be corrected. You know, some people, they get to such a position in life, they feel that now nobody can correct them except God. And God does correct uh, such people, but the correction can be very, very hard and uh, can bring uh, something that is indelible shame upon such an individual. Number five is because of possession. Some people, because of their property, some people, because of their possession, the things they own, they are very proud. In Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, reading from verse 30. Here we come to the case of Nebuchadnezzar. And here it is, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of, by my might, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the mouth of the king, in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. If you read the rest of the story, 
he became mental, was insane, and actually ate grass like animals. Number six is because of their attainment. Some people, because of achievement, because of attainment, they are proud. And they will not give honor or glory to God who has prospered them and made them to achieve what they have achieved. Daniel chapter 5 verse 23. But as lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and, uh, and they have brought the vessels of the house before thee, of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the God of silver and of gold and of brass and of iron, wood, stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Therefore you find some people, because of the material things they have, the things that they will leave behind, that's why they are, uh, they are proud. Other people is because of religion, holier than thou. I belong to the best church. I belong to the first church of the country. And because of that religion, like the Pharisees, they are proud, even though the religion does not give them salvation. Other people is because of their security. Obadiah verse 3. Obadiah verse 3. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou, hast, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, and saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Whatever may cause the pride. We know the attitude of God is that he hates pride. He resists the proud. What's the punishment? The punishment uh, actually vary. For some, it's abasement. The Lord just puts them down. Other people, it's total rejection. The Lord rejects them and sees them from afar. Other people, it is the wrath of God, the judgment of God. And it is spiritual poverty, eventually a spiritual death, total separation from God. And if they die in their pride, like Nebuchadnezzar, like uh, Belshazzar, like uh, Herod, like uh, Pharaoh died in pride, then they suffer eternal punishment in hell. But thank God we don't have to remain proud. We can come in humility before the Lord, and then the Lord promises He will give grace to the humble. James chapter 4, verse 6. James chapter 4, reading from verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Actually, humility begins by the time you begin to confess that you are a sinner. It takes humility to be able to do that. And then when you pray and you say, Lord, I know I cannot save myself. There is nothing in me that can produce salvation. Oh, Lord, I come to you. You are the only one I depend upon that can save me. Then the grace of God comes to you. You are born again. After you are born again, you remain humble. You go back to the Lord. You don't say, I will not confess anything anymore. If you make a mistake, if there is a fault, or if something happens, you will not say, well, I'm a child of God, and I, there is nothing, there's no problem. You go back to God in humility. Oh, Lord, I wasn't happy with that thing that happened to me, that thing I said, the way I reacted to that brother, what I said to that sister, the way I corrected that individual, it was not correction, it was criticism. Him. You'll be humble enough to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I am sorry. You'll even be humble enough to apologize to your fellow brother and your fellow sister. That's how the grace of God will continue in your life. Of course, you also realize you need sanctification. And you go back to God again in humility. You, you bend low before the cross of the Lord. And that is what grants you that sanctification. Then you go back to God. You want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You have a little duty, a responsibility in the house of God. Lord, I cannot do it effectively. Except your grace will be upon my life. That confession you are making to the Lord is an evidence of your humility. Actually, we need the grace of God in our lives. And it is only as we remain humble in the sight of the Lord, that's only how we can keep that grace of God or have more of the grace of God in our lives. In First Peter chapter 5. 
First Peter chapter 5 from verse 5 and verse 6. Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. It's unfortunate some people that profess to be born again. They do not understand anymore that there are people who are older than themselves. And once they become house fellowship leader, it may be that there is a house fellowship member. And this house fellowship member may be old enough to be their father. The way they will talk rudely, the way they will command, the way they will say whatever they say, they, you will understand they have not read the scripture that says, Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Then it says, Ye, all of you. All of you means whether we are leaders, we are coordinators, we are women coordinators, we are workers, we are members in the church. Be subject one to another. There's mutual respect. I respect you, you respect me. The workers respect the members, the members respect the workers. The husband respects the wife and the wife respects the husband. Ye, all of you, be subject one to another and be Closed with humility. That means humility is not just to be broad, as broad as an anchor It is to be broad as a blanket that will cover you completely. Be clothed with humility. Why? For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore. Therefore means because you know he gives grace to the humble. And you need more of the grace of God to overcome temptation. You need grace. And to live a godly life, you need grace. To live a peaceful life, you need grace. To be able to have opportunities serving in the house of God, you need grace. Because of the grace you need, and that grace can only be made available to those who are humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That talks to the people that are ministering. When you are ministering, the mighty hand of God is upon you. Maybe you are a leader, maybe you are a preacher, maybe you are a coordinator. And you are preaching or you are praying. You are under the mighty hand of God. If pride comes at that time, then God rejects you. And he cannot channel his power, his grace through you anymore. Under the mighty hand of God, you humble yourself so that God will exalt you in due season. Look at the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. Matthew 23, verse 12. 12. Hear the words of Jesus. It says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, shall be brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Matthew chapter 18. Let's read from verse, uh, from verse 1. And at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's a question the Lord never wants us to ask. Because when we ask that, we're looking for position. We're looking for recognition. And Jesus called the little child unto him. And set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. There are many people that still remain in pride and they say they are born again. They are proud. They say they are even sanctified. They are proud and they tell us they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. You cannot even get into the kingdom of God. You cannot even enter if you are not as humble as little children. Verse 4, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. Here the Lord himself is telling us the way he evaluates the people who are humble and the way he reacts and relates to the people that are humble. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble 
and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The word of God is very, very clear that if we want the blessing of the Lord in our lives, it requires that we will be humble, humbling ourselves at the foot of the cross. God will give us the grace to pardon and save us. And as we walk humbly with our God, He continues to give us more grace, abundant grace, sufficient grace. God promotes and exalts the humble. The more we confess and accept that we are nothing in ourselves, the more we give God the glory for all the good things He does in us and through us, the less we think of ourselves, our worthiness or our worth, our achievements, and the more we prefer others above ourselves, the more the grace of God will be bestowed upon us. Then there will be revival, there will be deeper Christian experiences, there will be greater and more profitable Christian service, greater opportunities in the kingdom of God when we humble ourselves more and more before the Lord. Let's look at Philippians chapter philippians chapter 2 and look at jesus christ our lord and savior look at the perfect example he has left for us if anybody had any reason to be proud jesus would have had millions of reasons to be proud you have none i have none we have no reason to be proud he had reasons to be proud if he wanted to be proud but no he had given us the perfect example of humility philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 5 let this might be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Are we like that? Are we trying to get that reputation, that recognition by all means, by force? He took upon him the form of a servant. Do we take the form of a servant? Do we act like servant? Are we humble like servant? And he was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What was the result? What was the consequence? What did God the Father do as a result of Christ humbling himself? Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What's the conclusion? What does it mean for us, for you and for me? Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or being glory. Whatever we do in strife will not be rewarded by God. In fact, will be judged by God. And whatever we do with vainglory, with high-mindedness, and with pride will be judged by God. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Can we find reasons why that brother will be better than myself? That sister will be better than myself? Something he knows, something he can do, which I don't know, which I cannot do. And then we're humble before God and humble before one another. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. You have the choice tonight, my brothers and sisters, to make a choice. You can make a choice to be like Pharaoh. To be like Herod, to be like Belshazzar, or to be like Uzziah, or to be like the proud people of the Bible, this that God judged. Or you can make up your mind and make a choice to be like Jesus Christ and to be like Paul, who said, I'm not worthy to be even an apostle. You can be like a humble person and then the blessing of the Lord will be upon your life. And then God will exalt you. God will give you more grace. God will give you more, more privilege to serve him. And the presence of God will be in your life. He will honor you. There will be the favor of God in your life. Manifold blessings. And then eventually you'll get to the kingdom of God. And you'll be one of the greatest in the kingdom of God. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. We want to be humble. There's nothing to be proud about. We were sinners. We were in darkness. We knew nothing. We had nothing. It's when we came into the kingdom of God, he made us somebody. Let's be grateful to the Lord. We are nothing in ourselves. Don't forget that. We are nothing in ourselves. Nothing to be proud about. Let us talk to the Lord that God himself will make us humble. He will make us humble. There should be humility in the family between husband and wife, parents and children. 
humility in the local church, in the district, between members and members, workers and their leaders, workers and the members. Humility between the younger and the elder. We shall recognize there are people that are older than ourselves. Give them honor, give them respect. Let's be humble before one another. Be humble and God will give you more grace. Spiritual gift, humility. Whatever you inquire from the Lord, it is an important virtue. It is very, very important to talk to the Lord. God we give you humility like a blanket that you will be clothed with it. need forgiveness of sin humility you need it father help us to be humble Lord we humble ourselves oh God before you we humble ourselves oh God before one, one another before our fellow brethren in our service oh God to you and to our fellow man father in all of this disposition of God in everything that we do Lord Father we ask that we be humble Father we don't want to be like the proud people mentioned of God in the scripture Father we don't want to be the proud people in the world father as believers as the children we humble ourselves before you in any way oh lord that we are proud of god unknowingly to us father open our eyes open our hearts the eyes of our understanding That we, O oh God, may repent of faith and obtain your mercy and forgiveness. Cleanse us, Lord. Purify us, Lord. Just like the little children, O oh God, that we will humble ourselves. That heaven, O oh God, will not be far away from us. Just like Jesus, let us in spirit be in us. That same spirit that was in Christ Jesus. Father, let it be in us, O oh God. The spirit of humility. Putting away everything of this world and all the attainment and achievement. Putting away, oh God, our personalities, oh God, our being and our knowledge. And holding on, oh God, to your grace. More grace, oh God, in our lives, in the church. More grace, oh Lord, in everything that we do. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we bless you. We give you all the praise. Your word is a light unto our part. You have enlightened our understanding with your word. Father, may this word never stand against us on the last day. Amen. The same spirit that was in Christ Jesus, let it be in us. 
that will live, oh God, our lives serving you in humility. That the reward for the humble will be ours. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. God bless you. Praise the Lord. That hallelujah is too small. I said praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That is it. Amen. Once again, you're welcome to today's service. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is the best place to be, fellowshipping with a brethren. Every Sunday like this is our, is our Bible, is our Sunday service. We start by 8.50 a.m till 11.30. There is a lot of benefit, a lot of blessing attached when we obey God's instruction, when we obey his commandment by not neglecting the gathering of the saints. And as we find time to come and also invite people, enlighten them, don't just invite them, make them to understand that it is an instruction from the Lord, that they need to come and hear the word of God. And as you do so, God will touch them and they will come with you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the evening of Sundays, we do have our house fellowship, visitation, and evangelism. By God's grace, we need to go into evangelism in full force. Because how can they hear if they are not told? If they are not being preached to, how will they hear? So God will help us in Jesus' name. Every Monday is a Bible study. It is a time where we gather together and take a microscopic view of the Word of God. When you come, you hear things that you don't even know it is in the Scripture, the reinterpretation of the Word of God. And by the time you leave, you will know that, yes, spiritually, physically, in every area, that you have been lifted up. And for those of us who are coming, let's not enjoy this blessing alone. Invite your loved ones, your friends, your neighbor, so that they will also be a partaker of these divine blessings. On Thursday, is our online conference prayer. is an online conference prayer in which we pray through um, phone com communication. To join the online conference prayer, there is a dialing number, which is 712-775-7035. And the access code is 344-823. We have people joining us also outside the United States. So we who are here, we should try as much as possible to be part of it. Because when you intercede for people, God will do 
the things that you did not even ask for. He will just be answering, he will just be doing more things for you. So on that time we pray, we intercede, and as we join, you will discover God's mighty hands upon your life in Jesus' name. And also every Monday, first and third Monday of the month is our night video. It has been a glorious and a wonderful time with the Lord. Let's not be tired. Let's find time to join us just two hours all night. Invite the people. People are facing so many challenges. They need prayers. Tell them there is, this is a house of solution. And when they come, God will meet them at the point of their need in Jesus' name. I think that will be the few announcements. For now, if there is any other announcement, it will be relayed to us later by a pastor. Offering time. Offering time. Let's lift up our offering before the Lord. Gracious God, we thank you. We appreciate you. There is none like unto thee in all the air. Father, the gold and silver, the cattle upon the hills, they are yours. You are the giver. You are our sufficiency. Father, you've provided for us, and that is why, oh God, we are able to bring this token to support your work. For as our hands will go that lifted up, but the hands will never go down in Jesus' name. For I will give in away lack, will give in away sorrows, will give in away disappointments, tendency. For I pray, O oh God, for those of God who don't have to give, provide for them and give them the hearts to give. <coughs> For those, O oh God, who have to give, for I bless them, increase them, O oh God, that they will give more to, to your work. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Imela chine ke na nemo onye ke ruwa nemo imela chine ke na nemo onye ke ruwa nemo imela Praise the Lord. Let us be seated. I know it's a good exercise for us. Up, down, up, down. It is well in Jesus' name. I know we listening to that powerful message. Um, I was expecting everybody to be jotting down and keep thinking about it in our mind. And then I believe I will do all my effort to make the CD of it so that we will be listening to it again. And uh, God is going to help us as we are doing so in Jesus' name. I want to thank every one of us that attended the workers' meeting yesterday. If I do not do mistake, that would have been the best workers' meeting we ever had. It was uh, just a very pleasant. I pray that Almighty God is going to be continue to help us in Jesus' name. Uh, I want us to keep praying for our pastor that is visiting us uh, he's coming from nigeria he came on um uh, what is it on missionary to is it puerto rico to puerto rico that the name the best name so he came from to puerto rico and he has decided that he is going to use four days with us one thing I want us to be praying for me is this, for us is this. By the grace of the Lord, I know that I'm doubting, but something good, ne prayer. What is not good, ne prayer. It will not change his mind. 
because I know who is he. I know how for him to humble himself to say he's coming here for four days. So I know a lot of challenges that if, let's say, it was hard, a lot of things that will come in. So I want us to be keep praying on that area that Almighty God will not, anything that will change his mind, anything that will disturb him. There are some things we may say if it is the will of God. But do not forget that God knows that there will be way. Then he said, ask, and you shall be given. Then knock. He said, if it is the will of God, one thing I will ask you to ask. He says, when you are asking according to the flesh, then you think in that way. But the, the kingdom of God has become violence. So, please, let us do all what we are. I don't want him to change his mind. And then when he comes, we know what I mean. By the time he's on the pulpit, we, we, you will know what I mean. And God is going to help us in Jesus' name. Please, let's do all what we can do in prayer, in fasting, for him to land there. And God is going to help us in Jesus' name. Uh, look at the pulpit very well. We have been using it for almost more than six years now. You know, this is the house of the Lord. I imagine if I come to any of any of us house, including my house, and something like this, we believe that my house is not fine. My house is not beautiful. Please, including me, whatever we can do to change this puppet, God will help us in Jesus' name. And if you didn't, I've done all the adjustments. Inside yet too has broken. But we have been using it for almost six years now. So whatever we can do, please. Let, eh? More than six. Praise the Lord. It, it seems like so that I, you, you are it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you for reminding me. So please, whatever we can do about it, let us go with us in Jesus' name. Headquarter meetings, let us take it in mind. In fact, this morning I was decided, I decided that, okay, if all this meeting is going to be, continue to help us, I may be go on Saturday, go and come, but I'm looking at inconvenience, I mean, conveniences of them, because I will go to work. That one is giving me a lot of concern, but whatever it, it may be, please, let us do at least maybe one of us or quarterly they at least they are seeing us in that meeting god is going to help us in jesus name that's how the our father and the lord will be happy that uh, these children they are remembering me and almighty god is going to continue to be with all, every one of us in jesus name if they are saying other thing i will let us know Praise and worship.
lift up my voice in praise. I lift up my voice in praise. For I know you are always there for me. Almighty God, you are my all in all. No matter what I say, my troubles come my way, I will praise the Lord today, today. Oh, I lift up my voice in prayer.
Jesus name I am a success in Jesus name I am a success I'm not a failure I am a success what about you? I am a session I praise that the the grace of thanking him every time it will not elude us in Jesus name and this grace will continue to be upon us in Jesus name we shall open our Bible which are going to Bible reading John chapter 11 John chapter 11 A certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then, after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. 
Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way, and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come, and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly, and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. 
And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. May God bless his word now, our heart in Jesus' name. Um, the house fellowship leader didn't tell us about the house fellowship in this evening. I think we said we are going to Mr. Mesa House or because he had an accident recently. So we are visiting him to console his family. God will help us as we are doing so in Jesus' name. We shall listen to the choir mes message. After the choir, our brother will come on the pulpit for the message by the, by, for the message by the grace of God. Praise the Lord.
In Jesus' name we pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for a wonderful moment in our lives. Father, we thank you for the prayers that came from this pulpit. Father, Lord in heaven, even for the songs. The announcement, Lord in heaven, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for the sermon that we heard this morning. Father, we heard about, Lord in heaven, humility. To make ourselves as children. Children being the greatest in your kingdom. Father, Lord in heaven, even as your son Jesus has wisdom, Father, we ask for the same wisdom. Amen. Lord in heaven, he will have said he is the greatest in your kingdom because he's your son. He's God himself. He will have named somebody else, but through the teaching that Father, your spirit in, his, in, his, in him, Lord in heaven, he said little children are the greatest in your kingdom. Father, make us humble. Father, through humility, we will see in the eyes of exaltedness. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, even as we're going to hear again from you, Father God in heaven, teach us your word. Why are we here this morning? It's a question each and every one of us will need to answer for ourselves. Father, teach us your word. Father, we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This might be, you can please be seated. This might be the greatest sermon of my life. So I want you all to please be attentive and listen. I will tell you that this might be the greatest sermon of my life. It might be life-changing for you also. There's a song that we sing all the time. I know my Redeemer leave it. I know my Redeemer leave it. I know my Redeemer leave it. He leave it forevermore. I know my Redeemer leave it. I know my Redeemer leave it. I know my Redeemer leave it. He leave it forevermore. Praise the Lord. Why did I sing this song? So I know. When you say that I know, what does that mean? The Bible, there are so many places in the Bible that talks about knowledge and what is the meaning of I know. It started right from the beginning. Right from the beginning, from the time of Adam and Eve. That is why I said that we need to all listen very carefully. If you are asleep today, please take some coffee. I will try to only talk for 30 minutes. Amen? So the title of the message today, Knowledge. I know. Knowledge. I know. Why do I need to talk about knowledge? When I look briefly in the dictionary, it says to know, to be aware of. So to be aware of. Through observations, inquiry, or information. So to be aware of something, right? To be aware is to know. And then when I look at knowledge itself, it says information, skills acquired by a person through experience or so-called education, the practical or theoretical understanding of a subject. I know, to be aware of knowledge, information, skills that you have acquired all through time. In my view, knowledge is more closer to my meaning of what education means. Like I said, we need to listen carefully. The reason why I said we need to listen very careful is because that, that is the lack of knowledge is the begin, was the beginning of the fall of man himself. That was why Adam and Eve felt 
And that is what brings fight today to our houses, to the church at work. You know, I come to you and say, I know you are a thief. 